Hello. 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 Hello, everybody that's joining. And I see people are already beginning to come into the channel. Um, hello, Theodore Brunn. Is it Brunn or Brunn? It's Brunn. It's definitely a Brunn because there's a, Brun. a, a very recent, recent Danish past. Although everyone, basically, apart from my family, calls me Brunn. So I'll answer to, to both. Okay. Of so, and, and do you mind being called Theo or do you like being called Theodore? I'd, I'd prefer Theo. I go by Thank Theo you. as a friend. It's just because on the books, you know, it's... Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, of course, so. you can't waste, waste the half of your name, can you? And you've got to put it on. I mean, the, 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 second, the second name is so short. You need something to kind of counter it. Okay. Well, if it's okay with you, then I'll call you Theo. And yes. um, so welcome, Theodore, Theo Brunn. And um, before I give you the introduction, I'm going to just say what beer I'm going to drink. I've just um, opened this, uh, this beer, and it is Small Giant there yeah, by... Stuart Brewing, and um, I'm going to attempt to pour it without spilling into this drinking horn, as promised. That's so not this is where it's much of your drinking horn, is it? Well, actually, I suppose it's got. I, no, the, drink, the, the hand, drinking, the drinking horn, is very a, boringly is... drinking a Peroni. Uh, oh and goodness. in fact, most of it's gone already. But I've got some more. I'll pour Look that at... in to my drinking horn, which is slightly smaller. I'm ashamed to say. Look at this. I'm getting. <clears> I think. Oh, it's like a pint can, and I'm not going to go all the way, but it's um, it's getting there. Anyway, skull we have first. Skull. skull. Oh, look at that! Two two Viking authors, frothy Italian Viking beer. historical fiction authors. <sighs> yes, it's a, well. Maybe Lombardy and or something. Yeah, um, I'm funny. I'm writing about the Lombards right now. So ah, okay. well, I'm going to be I'm going to be okay. touching on them sometime. But before we get onto that, let me just yeah. introduce you. So, this is um, one of the regular or semi-regular talks that I've been doing with um, different writers. And originally, it was called um, I think it was called what was it called something and history and books and history. And um, it seemed to be a running theme that um, I did not drinking beer with, or some sort of alcoholic beverage with people. And I changed the name to Books and Booze, kind of um, a bit tongue in cheek, but um, that seems to have stuck. I'm hoping it doesn't offend anybody. I'm sort of waiting for somebody to say that they're offended by that. But anyway, Books and Booze it is at the moment. Um, so welcome, Theodore Brunn. And I've got some notes over here, which is why I'm looking Thank over you. at my little notepad to say a little bit about you. So... I know that you um, you are, as I said, a historical fiction author. You have so far published three historical fiction novels, as far as I'm aware, which mm. are the Wanderer Chronicles. And the first one is A Sacred Storm, um, and then A Mighty Dawn, and then A Burning Sea, most recently. And they are all set in what century? Are they? Early, the early 8th century. Initially okay. Scandinavia was the first couple, and then we, we stretch our legs a bit and end up in Constantinople in the third one. Okay. <laughs> so I'm seeing people pinging messages in, somebody saying that um, that she's offended, Charlotte. But then she oh, says that's she's my not. friend Charlotte. She but then she's, is, she's saying she's, she's joking, thank goodness. I see she's nothing not, she's not she offended. says. She actually does. She actually mean, but <laughs> well, maybe she doesn't deep, mean that deep, she's that she's the not irony runs deep in that one. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so three three historical fiction novels. Um, any other published works that we should be aware of? I've got a couple of books that uh, I've ghost written, um, mm. which and in fact I sort of do a sideline in in ghost writing alongside my historical fiction books, which is why it takes me a little bit longer to go on the next one. Um, I have also written a children's north fantasy which i'm still mm. trying to trying to flog to someone but as yet hasn't hasn't found a home so i may have okay. to resort to uh self-publishing which i know absolutely nothing about but maybe you can help me on that one well maybe maybe um so before you took up the pen or the the keyboard to write um you studied dark age archaeology is that correct yeah, quite a long time before. Um, I There was quite a large gap where I, I was a, a working lawyer for, I don't know, six, seven years, I think. Um, I studied Dark Age archaeology at University at Cambridge. 
and actually I didn't like it at all. <laughs> I found it quite boring, or, or at least the 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 the, the, the problem the problem I had when I was doing doing this was that it was sort of uncoupled. You had the archaeology, but you didn't have the history and the literature part of the same degree. And I think you very much need that bit to bring the material culture to life. And I was kind of lacking with that until a few years after leaving university, when I was in the midst of trying to make a career as a lawyer, I kind of came across some uh, some of the original source materials for the Scandinavian sort of mythology and the mythological poems and what have you. And then it sort of, that was a bit of a spark that led to everything that followed. Okay, that's interesting. So, so where were you when the spark <clears throat> first hit and you decided this is what well, you very write. specifically. And it's tell quite us a the weird story about how you came to. It's quite a weird, uh, weird portal into this world. Um, considering I had the background, so I'm half Danish. So in theory, I should be all over this stuff, but I really wasn't. Um, did did Scandinavian archaeology, or what was called Scandinavian archaeology, a bit of Anglo-Saxon archaeology at uni? Then I was like, okay, I'm not going to be an archaeologist. So I go off and do 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 the law, but I ha I went to when I was at law school, I um, was revising for some exams, and I was living with a guy whose brother was a great opera singer, and he was always banging on about Wagner's Ring Cycle as like a really good sort of piece of artwork, or, you know, music and and just creation of art. And I happened to be walking along a road in London one uh, afternoon and in, in the days when HMV still existed and there were CDs and saw that there was a highlights of a ring cycle was a double CD that I could pick up for two quid. And I thought, well, I've got to revise for all these exams. So I'll just listen to this classical music whilst I'm doing it. Little did I know that that CD was going to kind of become almost obsessive in terms of, and then also that portal into the world that Wagner created which is, I suppose, it's actually set in the fourth century, so it's a slightly different period, but it's drawing all, all the same sort of source material that you use, that you know Giles mm -hmm. uses, that um, uh, Tolkien used, that C.S. Lewis used, George R.R. R. Martin. It's basically the, these sort of ancient pagan poetry, um, you know, Beowulf, uh, Sigurd the Dragon Slayer. Uh, in fact, I've got some of them next to me. Uh, and the particular one, the Saga of the Volsung, was something that I read and it's quite brutal and there's and it's quite weird as well. There's some very sort of strange sort of episodes described in it. And that was like, you know, it sort of triggered something in, in my mind. Even that wasn't actually the trigger to starting writing, but it was it, it created in me an interest far beyond what I'd seen, you know, in terms of studying the subject. Uh, this was kind of, you know, this this caught a spark in my imagination. But I wasn't a writer. Uh, had no aspirations to be a writer and in fact I thought I think I'd been led to believe earlier on in my schooling that kind of the arts and creative writing was just something not for me so it took quite a quite a while before ideas started building that they, I then actually said said you know I'll, I'll put pen to paper how okay, was it for you how did you get into have you always been been writing stories uh, a bit. So I, I, I've always been a, an avid reader, um, and I, I used to read lots of fantasy. Um, the first, I think, the first novel I read cover to cover was probably The Hobbit when I was sort of just starting sort of secondary school, and 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 I, I got really into fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons and all of that stuff, you know, Conan and all those things. Yeah. Um, so I'd always read a lot, and I think every now and again, um, partly because Dungeons and Dragons and role playing is kind of telling stories. Basically, it's telling stories but with with other people. So you're sort of telling a story on the fly, um, you know, using characters that you've created and situations that, that a dungeon master has created. Um, so I think I'd always had that sort of idea of telling stories. But um, every now and again, I would sit down and and try to I sort of start what I thought would become a, a, a grand novel, um, often sort of based on something I'd read or, or seen in you know a film or for something. And I would write three or four pages of what I considered to be you know great prose. And then yeah. I would, um, that was it, you know, it's like three or four pages was about as much as I could write. And then it becomes quite difficult, you know, after that to sort of think, how do I, where do I go from here? You know, I've had this idea for a great beginning. I remember mm. one, you know, it's like a warrior is running through a forest or something, something's chasing him. And I remember thinking, oh, this is great. And then I didn't, that was it, you know, and then I wrote like three or four pages and then just that, and nothing ever happened. And so it wasn't then until I was um, basically 30, 
um, and I saw a documentary and I, and, uh, about Bamber Castle um, and the bowl hole um, uh, archaeological dig there where they dug out all these um, graves and the skeletons for, and dating back from like the 7th century. Um, and they were talking oh, yeah. all about the fact that um, Bamber Castle was like the seat of the kings of Bernicia back in, yeah, in the seventh century right, yeah. and i and i didn't know anything about it and so and I'd, <clears> I'd lived near there as a, as a as a kid and so something just sort of clicked and i thought i think it is a bit of you know swords and anglo-saxons it's kind of vikingy thing in my head i thought they're going sort of long ships and things in this documentary and i thought oh you know this is sort of something about that sparked and i knew the landscape knew the area and i just started writing and then and for some reason that stuck with me and i was maybe the right age to start researching and proper mm. sort of going for it. although it took years i mean i didn't finish lots of things happened but you know i didn't actually finish that first novel for about 14 years or something you know it took a long long time as yeah. first novels do i think um yeah because because i just didn't know what i was doing and so i was just sort of piecing it together bit by bit and in the end it all sort of came in a rush the sort of the last two thirds of the book i wrote in about six months the rest of it took me about 12 years or something to 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 write so a bit I didn't I wasn't writing all the time I sort of threw it away for a while and but um I never but had any aspirations managed, and you were doing you were doing that alongside your full time job yeah I had a full time so you were job sort of squeezing and... in squeezing in little bits here and little bits there it's quite difficult to string it together when it's yeah so piecemeal isn't it it is and I think I was saying to you just before we came on air I think um in some ways it was it was great um a great discipline over those years because the first three or four books i wrote whilst working um full time probably the first six books actually i was still working um and i i, I used to have to write in really small windows of opportunity and so i think having that moment of just saying i'm going to sit down for an hour i've only got an hour until the kids finish taekwondo class or whatever it was and i would sit at the back of the hall with headphones on and a laptop and i would just write and all the parents were there and the kids were doing taekwondo and all the parents would be chatting and sort of thinking why is he so rude and he's just ignoring everybody and i would just think tr 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 i'm going to use this time because i realized there's so much of my time with two young kids that were just spent waiting for kids yeah for the kids to, yeah. to, to finish things when they get to the certain age they're doing clubs and going to parties and things there were so many times that i was thinking i'm just sitting here for an hour i've got nothing why don't i use that hour and so that's how i wrote the serpent sword really i, I did it pretty much like that um but what sort of this, age were your kids at that point? So just trying to think. Um, so I probably picked it up again, what, 2012 or something. So my my eldest was probably like 12 or 13. And my youngest was eight or nine, something like that. So they're sort of... And so they were still sort of bit, functioning human beings. They're this functioning is, human is, beings, but but they're having to yeah. ferry them to clubs and then drop them yes, off places. Say, and, yeah, there's always something else isn't it <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. you think you're out of one stage but then something else appears no because I've, I've definitely struggled in the last sort of couple of years for to have not just one child but two and a, and a you know obviously a small one um and that has been yeah to get the writing in around around sort of you know and we do all our ch own child care so it's quite a, a yeah quite and, a challenge. and during lockdowns and stuff as well so you've got none of that moment of sort of you know getting out and away from yeah. everything so yeah i can imagine that would be really difficult i found it difficult and my kids have grown up you know now and i found it difficult because the, the you know family were around and that's one of the reasons i converted this this garage that i'm sitting in now is to be able to sort of have a space where i could concentrate because it was just so difficult to to concentrate know, just I'm everybody very, being I'm in very house. jealous I'm very jealous. And you, you can come. You I, can dream, come I dream of the yeah the, the the garage i can just walk off into and shut the door yeah um, no, that's a bit, a bit harsh. I've got. It doesn't I, I always keep me. Bit. It doesn't always keep me away. I mean, they they they, they come yeah. out, knock on the door, and say, "Come on, you got to come back and do something or whatever." So <laughs> they don't leave me alone, which is this is good. They haven't forgotten about me yet. So yeah. I got I got a question about um, your past that I was interested yeah. in. I read on your website about this amazing bike ride. So the way yeah. I, I read it on your website is like you you had this sort of damascene moment of i'm going to write this book and then you jumped on a bicycle and you just started pedaling and where were you and well tell me the real story first and and where were you and where did you pedal to and what was all that about well it was all yeah it was all it's all very much connected in why how i got into this in the first place because you know if you told me even sort of two three years before i started writing that's what you're going to end up doing as a career i just 
could never have seen the way through to how that would have happened. So basically I had a, um, I was a lawyer, but I took a year out from law, ended up uh, going to Oxford, doing a degree, a sort of theology uh, diploma. It wasn't even a full degree. And at the end of that, it, it, it sort of, it fell right when the world financial crisis hit. So basically having been in a really great, great legal job, although not enjoying it very much, I sort of came out the other end of that going, uh, there are no jobs. I don't really want to be a lawyer, but then I don't know kind of why I did this this year. But at the very end of that academic year, I went to a lecture uh, that was about um, three uh, was it, missionaries, I think, through through history. And one of them was this guy, uh, Face, who I don't know, you might have heard of. He's a... Uh, He's uh, he was an, actually an Englishman called Winfred, but he he ended up his name was changed to Saint Boniface and became patron saint of the Germans. And in the lecture, it describes how this Christian monk uh, had this kind of altercation with a bunch of pagans in a dark German forest and ends up chopping down their favourite oak tree, the, the dedicated to the god Thor, which I think happened more than one occasion. <laughs> and I was like, mm, would they just let him do that? I so so. Already, I kind of saw this scene in my mind and saw this conflict between the sort of fault line between paganism and Christianity and this kind of dark period of history. And then I, I was kind of interested in him. So I ended up getting hold of a proper book about a proper history book about him. And it turned out that he um, had quite a lot of connections, I think, with the uh, area of history you're now looking at, the Carolingians or the Merovingian kings. And in this history book, suddenly you see, hang on, the Muslims are up there in Paris, like invading France. You're like, oh, hang on, there's 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 quite a lot going on here in this history. So I I suppose that stage that you're at, where you're jotting down scenes and what have you, I started letting the idea in my head, and I thought, well, he's not going to be the main character. Who's a character that um, can sort of be a lens through which he might tell this story? And so I suppose I came back to my uh, you know, Wagner, Wagnerian sort of imagination and all seedbed of all these kind of uh, old Norse heroes. And I was like, okay, so maybe the main protagonist is 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 neither Christian nor Muslim. He's actually a pagan from up north. So, th so then th this book starts, this story starts materializing. Meanwhile, in my life, uh, I've had a collapsed um, uh, engagement. So I'm sort of on my downers when I've come out of this this. Uh, academic year and I end up my brother was working out in Hong Kong so I ended up taking this pretty mediocre job working in as a lawyer in-house for actually a but uh, of all things a facial mask medical face mask company um, <laughs> so I know a little bit about medical face masks. Uh and so this was 10 years ago and I did a year in Hong Kong but I was like essentially depressed like I was very sort of lost in terms of what am I doing with my life and I kind of but I started writing these scenes and kept developing the story. And eventually I looked at it and thought, you know what? I sort of owe it to what I have here to try and write this thing. And when I, when I reflected on like, if I project forward, say 30 years in my life and say, this was Theo, he was a lawyer. He sort of tried to help lots of other people get, realize their ideas. I felt like pretty flat. Whereas if I thought, you know, Theo is the writer, at least I can have a, have a go. Maybe I'll fail. But, I'm, you know, that actually created a little bit of a thrill in me, which actually wasn't something I'd felt for quite a while at, at that stage in my life. So I ended up having uh, this a long, long way around of where I get to this. Um, ended up having a conversation uh, with uh, what a woman who was kind of, she was basically a friend, but she was also a kind of life coach. So she was asking all the right, right questions. And I had a couple of ideas like, I'm done here in Hong Kong. I'm basically done with the law. I've got this idea for a book. Uh, maybe I need to go back to England and, I don't know, become a teacher in order to then enable myself to have the time to write a book or try and write this book. And I said, but there is this other idea I keep having, which is a kind of daydream. And I, I lived up with my, my brother who was out in Hong Kong as well, up on top of the peak in Hong Kong. And quite often I sort of find myself looking out across the Hong Kong Bay to the mainland and just daydreaming about what it would be like to put on a pair of hiking boots and just walk off into China. I mean, this is how drastic my life had got. So, and then actually weirdly having had, I did actually buy a pair of hiking boots 
And so I said, uh, so w when I had this meeting with this friend, I kind of shyly volunteered this idea as like, you know, strat possibility number three. And she said, well, what's stopping you? And I was like, oh, okay, maybe nothing. I, I didn't have, a, I, there was no prospect of having a wife at mm -hmm. that point. Uh, no mortgage, you know, I had a bit of cash in my, in my account, but not much, you know, nothing holding me. And it, and it was, it was, I mean, in a way it's quite, useful in terms of the kind of stories that you and I write, these epic stories of like, you know, a protagonist kind of goes out into the unknown world. You know, that was exactly what I was living out. And I felt like I needed to go on this story. And actually for me at the time, it was about creating just a very basic objective to go from A to B. So then I started think, planning to hike back from Hong Kong all the way back to England. And around this time, I met this guy who'd actually cycled the other way. And he described having met this German guy uh, who was trying to walk back to Germany from the Himalayas. And it's, <laughs> he'd met him somewhere in Turkey, I think. And it's, he'd been walking for about four years. And I was like, hmm, I think, <laughs> I think my, my back of the fag packet calculation is a little bit off when I thought I could make it home in 18 months. So I was like, eventually downgraded to the bicycle. So that's that's kind of what I what I did. Um, it's so like that a modern day other... horse, right? It's like riding a horse all that way, really. I mean, it's the same yeah. sort of speed, I guess. And it was, well. yeah, and it was, I mean, an unbelievable adventure. I mean, it was just the time of my life, really. Um, but it didn't start that way. You know, you had no Mandarin whatsoever. I had about 10 lessons, I think, before I left. So it's just, you know, dive into mainland China and just, you know, all the kind of, funny ups and downs of, of a trying to make sense of like why the hell was I on this journey you know I was 33 I could have been probably well on the way to partnership in some flashy law firm you know what was I doing with my I just said I just broken up with this beautiful girl you know what was I doing here in China pedaling away sweating up and down this hill but you know it went on and on and on um and obviously got home and then to bring it back to the books, still had this idea for for this uh, historical fiction novel that I thought it was gonna be at that stage rather than series. Yeah. And so when I got home, um, I uh, was, there were, there were two choices. Like, okay, I wanna be a writer because I'd written a lot about the journey as I was doing it. And I thought, well, I can, the easy win is to write a book, a sort of travelogue book about what I've just done. But also I want to sort of get into, what, you know, how do you write a novel? By that stage, I've written a, probably a few chapters of in fiction, which most of which never saw the light of, you know, the actual book. And I was fortunate that I was, I'm from Norfolk, where my family are farm, my father's a farmer, my brother's still farming there. So it was kind of like a safe base for me, having come back from overseas. And there's a little, little worker's cottage on there I could sort of sit and use for free. So I came back and, and was putting out feelers in terms of who, who was interested in, in either of these two ideas. And it turned out no one was interested in a travel book unless I'd, you know, had my arm chopped off by a Kyrgyz bandit or, you know, your James Cracknell or Ben Fogel, um, which I wasn't. Uh, but when I started asking, telling to try to describe this historical fiction book, you know, people were like, oh, that's kind of, you know, that's quite a commercial area. Uh, it's an, it sounds like an original idea within that area. So then I kind of came up with a proposal, put it in front of a, a friend who is a who who is a quite a successful. Um, she's a sort of chip lit and thriller writer author, and she sent it to this hotshot author, um, agent in New York, who sadly is not my agent. I've got a very good agent back here in England, but he kind of made enough encouraging noises that made me think, all right, maybe I've got something here. So it's at that point. Contrary to like having to sit down and try and figure this ar out around a full time job, I just sort of sat, plonked myself down in this cottage and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And that's kind of how I churned out the first first novel. Okay. So now, are you writing full time now? Yeah. Still? I you're... write full time. Okay. But, so I do, what's... but it's not, I'm not, I, I sort of try and, um, you know, it's it's a bit like a I don't know what's the analogy, two barrel shotgun or something like that. It's like we've got the historical fiction uh, uh, novel writing bit of my writing, but then there's as I, as I mentioned earlier, the ghost writing bit, um, 
which to me for me anyway brings in a bit more money than uh my fiction writing which maybe we can talk about that in a minute um and and i also do a little bit of consultancy stuff about storytelling into corporations it's, it's a bit of the sort of leadership management training -y kind of stuff um which also brings in a bit of income so it's which is great because i think there was a time when uh, i was essentially putting all my eggs in the basket of these novels really taking off and i think you know actually yours are doing fantastically well mine mine slightly less well um but but you you, you never know what's going to happen with the life of a book do you you just you know absolutely yeah they you have sec it. second wins you know and actually that nothing is wasted in the sense of you know one book leads on to another and actually your story to, i'm finding that there's a sort of breadth to the storytelling that I'm doing at the moment. So yeah, I, my, my heart is with the novel writing and I really want those to sort of do well. Um, but I'm also involved in a screenwriting project that's nothing to do with history at all. It's all contemporary drama and that's all new stuff as well. I think the, the, the thing is that having made that big leap where you literally, you know, written myself off as ha having any creativity whatsoever, for most of my adult life, you know, to the age of about 34. And then now it's like, okay, you did write a novel and actually, oh, you, it's out there and people, you know, seem to appreciate it. So it makes you r much more kind of willing to just have a go at something. So that's kind of where I'm at with a bit of screenwriting is like, you know, essentially I'm a novice, but it's something that interests me. I watch quite a lot of TV series and what have you for, can formulate a story whether you can actually write an effective script is, is is kind of the cutting edge of where I'm at at the moment. But so there's a few different things going on. That's, I mean, it's all creative stuff, right? I mean, that's the, if writing, it's all different strands of the same sort of creative process, right? It's all writing and creating. So I totally get it. And great if you can manage to do it, like you say, if one thing isn't working as well as you'd hoped and you can't, just ride that wave, then definitely it makes sense to to spread things, you know, and, and try and do all different things. I mean, at the beginning yeah, of lockdown, in the fire, in the fire. Well, yeah, and, and at the beginning of lockdown, I was saying yes to everything, you know, anything that came away because, like you say, you just don't know what's going to happen. I'm thinking, I don't know, you know, I'm doing this as a living now, and if the whole everything collapses, I don't know if people are going to buy books, and I don't know what's going to happen. So. Yeah, I was just people would contact me about different things, and I was just saying, "Yep, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do this." And then after a while, you sort of think, "Well, okay, maybe I don't need to do certain things." But um, well, actually, I, I enjoyed. I did. Yeah, I, um, I, I know you you've done the... some mentoring stuff, haven't you? And yes. I, I did a bit yeah, of that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. And you did the with the history quill. Yeah, so I did um, a couple of masters. Like a, a very and... good, good, good outfit. Uh, I like what they're doing. But actually, did you, did you do the tutoring as well, where you're kind of coaching people who are? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did mentoring for a couple of a couple of guys. Um, I'm still in, in touch with both of them actually, and um, I'm not doing the mentoring now. I sort of wound that down, um, but but I'm still in touch with both of them. Um, and yeah, that was quite rewarding, and it was something a bit different. And during the lockdowns, it was a it was seeing an extra face that wasn't just. The, the the immediate family you know so it's like getting on a zoom call and talking about something different to someone you know to someone that wasn't just the, the people that you're sitting down with every day to watch netflix which was basically yeah. walking we the dog rather, and watching netflix really, that was yeah what did you what was your like addiction then during or was it everything was well, everything i don't know we watched so many series i can't remember now um I remember we watched things that we would never have normally watched, which was a, a bonus, I think. Um, so we ended up watching things like Call My Agent um, in French. Um, neither oh, yeah, speak, that's neither me and yeah. my wife speak that. French, but we watched it all in French with subtitles, and we found by the end of it, you felt like, I can, I'm can. i sure I can almost speak French now. You know, I studied <laughs> French when I was like you know, 12 or something, and I thought, yes, I can almost understand you know, this. Um, I watched the first episode of the remake of that, the English remake that's just come out last week, and it's just so pointless it's like what's the point of remaking know, something I, exactly the same they've just I literally, exactly the same, I literally just... did the same thing i, I watched I must, like, we must have been watching it very similar i think it was about a week ago i watched the first yeah. time i was like, mm. it's like what's the point you can sort of feel the cash going in someone's pocket here, yeah but yeah i mean uh, i suppose if we'd written call my agent and then somebody said i want to make an american remake of this which is exactly the same as the the version that you've already done or an english remake we wouldn't say no would we but um yeah yeah well, they did the so, same with the office, didn't they? 
So yes, I'm exactly. Yeah. With lots of, lots of things, but I, d- I didn't think so, that worked either. But, uh, so with your with your with your writing um, stuff, so back to the writing <clears> rather than watching Netflix. What um, what's your what's your routine really? I was going to say, you know, people quite often it, I get people watching that are aspiring writers or, or writers that, you know, are writing and they want to know, you know, what people do and sort of compare their own way of doing things. So what's well, your sort of writing I, I routine? Two, two answers to that, if I may. Um, my one, one was pre my second daughter and the other one is now. So in an ideal world, my, I, I'm, I'm definitely an early riser, which is, has been an incredibly sort of strengthening, uh, characteristic in in my marriage to to my wife tax because she's she's a late nighter and i'm an early morning riser so i can do one end of the day and she can do the other but i used to get up um fantastically early sort of when i had the freedom to do it sort of 5 five thirty, almost like you're still in the dream time kind of literally stumble out to a, a used to have a i mean we've moved now but a, a desk with sort of candles and kind of with a with a with a, a rug over my shoulders and just sort of bash out these very slightly surreal, you know, North themed uh, scenes, and and that worked really well for me. I mean, t- generally the word count would just go, brrr, um, so and, and you'd done sort of two thirds of your your day's word count by the time it was time to wake everyone else up. So in an ideal world, that was that's kind of what I'm gunning back towards. Uh, obviously, in those days, I would then continue writing through the day i used to say right let's do, uh, do which i think justin hill our, our friend does you know bash out two thousand words and then kind of you're done you can get on with the rest of your day but as uh you know i got married uh had kids started have, obviously having to support them more than just me as a as a kind of uh lonesome bachelor um so the rest of i, I i've had to start juggling it much more so now for example um, the way I'm organising myself currently, so I've got a, I've got a, a, a deadline for the next book in the, the Wanderer Chronicles in I think uh, late July, early August, and then a very similar one for a ghostwriting book, which is actually a co-writing project with a with a friend of mine um, in around the same sort of time. So I don't have in morning anymore. <laughs> I need the sleep, and I get up, fix the fix the the family, and so I'm probably at my desk by 9:30 on a good day. Mm-hmm. And then I'll do I'll do the ghostwriting one probably till lunch, and then assuming all goes well, I'll do probably till three or four on the novel. Um, and how many words I, do you get written on the novel? I only get about a thousand. Uh, if yeah. I, I only aim for a thousand, and sometimes I don't even hit that, depending on how the scene's going. That but for example, good. I've already I've already written a thousand on the ghostwriting book, so it's kind of out of necessity. I'm having to run these two books together, and it doesn't. It's not great in terms of you know, living that story in your head. It, 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 it was, it's probably no surprise that it was much easier when, you know, I literally had just an open day. I was kind of waking up dreaming of these characters and you're just so immersed in it that it just, you know, the next scene becomes very obvious and the characters yeah. really come to life. I don't know. But I haven't, maybe, I haven't maybe had you that. No, I ha- well, I haven't had that for ages now. <laughs> that sort of, and, and it's, it's felt, I think, as having gone full time, writing i was I, I was saying to you earlier that um before you know i was writing in these sort of one hour 45 minute windows i would get a lot written in a very short space of time and i'm still capable of if i've got an idea and i know what i'm writing i can write six seven hundred words in an hour um mm. for, you know and just get it down but i think i second guess myself a lot more now i think that, and um and i think i'm aware of the time as well so i'm kind of setting myself these goals of nominally about two thousand words a day mm. um when I'm properly in the flow of a book, I'll tend to hit that more or less, but that's working, you know, six hours or something, you know, in, in the day writing. Um, and this last week I've been doing something a bit new. And so I'm taking a lot of time thinking, so st- I, I write, you know, paragraph and then I think, Oh, but what about, Oh, I don't understand. Oh, where's this? And I don't really know anything about it because it's yeah. a totally different thing that I'm doing. Yeah. It's just a short story. I'm doing something a bit like a palate cleanser, really yeah, um yeah. and um but it's taking me but but obviously i'm not making it easy for myself so i've chosen a completely different historical period and i'm i still can i ask really can i ask what it is what historical period is it well shall i shall i show you some of my research books that i've got over here and you can maybe look i'll show you i'll show you one which i think will just um show enough 
Oh, cool. So there you go. Great. I think so everyone, is... everyone wants to be able to create a story in the old way, don't they? Yeah. So it's um at the moment I'm sort of thinking about writing a novel, but I just don't know. So I thought rather than just delve in, jump in straight into a novel, which is months and months of your life, I thought I'll try and write like a, a novella or a short story, mm. something maybe not even related to what the novel is going to be about, but just in that world. Mm. Um, but obviously it's 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 a real it's a real gear change. But like you, I mean, you're doing something. You're writing your Viking stuff in the afternoon, yeah. doing something completely different in the in the morning. So that sort of gear change thing, it, it it it's it can be difficult. But I think at the same time, maybe for you, it I don't know, maybe it feels more difficult, but maybe it's good in some ways as well. Keeps your brain. I think it's, jumping in around. theory it's good. Uh, I think I've just struggled a little bit with um, this fourth book. In that I. Uh, I mean, I, I lockdown was a funny one because I, I, I ended up sort of stepping away from the Wanderer Chronicles, writing this Norse uh, fantasy book for kids, oh, yeah. which actually just yeah. came out really easily and really quickly. And, and then my agent said, oh, this is, you know, this is great. Da, da, da. Put it out to, I don't know, 16, I think it was, publishers and like got a bite at one of them. And then it was just silent, silent, silence. And I, and I think it did... Uh, it, you know, knock my confidence for sure. Because at that point, almost at my most, had very, maybe slightly overinflated expectations. And then they were kind of dashed as I was launching into book number four. And there's, you know, confidence is such a uh, important part of what we're doing because that little voice in your head is there anyway, just kind of going, oh, you know, this seems a load of crap. Like, why did, you know, does anyone, is anyone ever going to read this? You know, these little voices that you sort of, get practiced at dialing down and um, and then various things were going on in the second half of last year that actually mainly did again just boringly to do with children but it just shows that if you're trying to create at the level that we're doing particularly you I mean you churn them out at, at a rate that like, frankly just bewilders me um, <laughs> it's very very impressive so ha hats off to you um, but that notion of like the creativity in your head, you have to look after quite well. And I was like getting broken sleep for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I would have reckoned myself like pretty hardy. I can take that. It's fine. You know, I'll get, I'll be the one to get up and do this and that. But over time, by Christmas time, I was just so like, probably just, you know, almost depressed, not quite. And the effect it had on your creativity was huge. And then I did a little bit of research about this and realized that there's like, uh, you know, the, the chemicals in your brain there's cortisol serotonin and da, 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 mm -hmm. without going into, into into that too much but when i realized that actually a lot of the cortisol uh, effects of cortisol is like a, di a dim diminishment of creativity i was like well no wonder every time i sit down on this blank page I'm yeah. getting a sort of befuddled um so i sort of fixed that at the start of this year and then almost had to you know i've used a lot of what i did in the second half of last year i'm kind of I have been able to to sort of chop and change and reuse, and now there's a lot more men momentum going with the whole thing. So I think I think I'll get there, but it's it's funny how you sort of think you got into a system, and then something comes and just throws you off, and you have to re-establish it again. Um, I don't Definitely, know you, yeah. You find I mean, that. I I found yeah. So it's it's interesting. So I mean, you, you talk about me, you know, creating lots of books quite quickly, and um, I'm sort of averaging about two books a year but but it's slowing down now i've I, the last my last contract i said i can't keep it up that that pace so i signed a contract for three books in two years so mm. it's a bit you know but 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 i found i found lockdown um and all of the bombarding it was just the negativity in the news and the bombardment mm. of all of this you know the, you had all of the um the, the political stuff i mean ever since brexit yeah, really, yeah. so 2016 onwards has been just this roller coaster, and then on top of that, you know, you bring in COVID and the lockdown and the sort of threat of the end of the world or whatever. You don't even know if you know, all yeah. your family are going to survive. And new, are you going to live? The bombs aren't going to get us. The, the the climate change will. Yeah, exactly. So all yeah. of this stuff. It just it's it's felt very much like a sort of every. And I think I've got a lot of time to myself. You know, walking the dog and. You know, and going into the house, making a cup of tea or whatever, and I'll put the radio on and I'm listening to the news and just all of that just got me down. I think there comes a moment when yeah, there's too much, killer, there's just too much in your head. And it's very, it, I find it extremely difficult to not be engaged with that because it's interesting and it's important and it's all really 
important stuff that you can't just turn your back on. So you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to just bury your head in the sand and go, la, 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 it's all great. You know, I'm just going to keep writing. But at the same time, I found I found it quite difficult to focus on the writing, even though I managed to get yeah. the books out. But I've I found that with each book, I find each book I think more difficult to write than the previous books. Um, but I think, but I think conversely, you know, people say, oh, they each one's getting better than the one before, which at some point can't continue but obviously i'm getting more practiced at the actual writing mm. but i find it more difficult and i think it's a relative thing and i think i'm kind of judging myself more harshly or um you know i know there's a certain number of people that are going to read the book now so there's an expectation mm. whereas maybe the first book i thought i don't know if anyone's going to read it but now i think mm. i know some people are going to read this and so it's a bit um i find it quite scary that sort of thing of you know is it any good what i'm writing so yeah i, I find that expectation do you, a bit do you scary. have like a do you have an individual in mind like who reads your books very much when they're fresh out of the oven as it were mm. like an alpha reader i don't know what you call yeah that, but... yeah i've got um there's uh one of my best mates <clears throat> a guy called gareth jones um who surprisingly with a name like that is welsh um so he uh he reads, and he's he, he's got the. Uh, well, there's a couple of, of mates as well. Uh, there's another guy, Shane and Simon, as well. They're both them. Um, so I got these sort of three. Uh, they, they started off with more beta readers, but but Gareth is the guy who always reads first. He always finishes first. He's a very fast reader, and he's taken pride in the fact that he finishes every book first now. So he's the only one so far who's finished the latest one, Forest of Foes, and got back to me. And that's not due out until December, but he's read the the draft and. Um, and yeah, his feedback was positive, so that's good. And I got some a little bit of feedback yesterday via WhatsApp from from Shane, Big Shane. Yeah. Um, so these are who, your mates, but they're they're, they're not mates, writers. Yeah. They're, they're, no, they're just, just they're just readers. They're sort yeah. of target audience readers. Absolutely, and in fact, Shane yeah. is a guy. So this guy Shane Smart, guy, guy I worked with, um, he hadn't uh, he hadn't read any novels for years. When I gave him the Serpent Sword way back when in twenty. 13 or whatever it was 2014 i don't know and um the early draft of that and he read it and since then he's become an avid reader and he reads not just my stuff but he reads you know loads of other people's books as well so i feel if if there's only one if there's one thing that that's that's, that's good out of out of this is that um i've got at least one person reading again which i think is is great and um and he well, says I, really nice what things i love about your 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 books <laughs> that the protagonists are very very different You've got is it is three series? Have you got any? You got, I've got two. I've got series, two yeah. series and a standalone at the moment. So there's been three protagonists. Are you, are you going to do anything more with the Wolf of Wessex character? Um, no, no at, 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 the, at the beginning, I had a plan. Oh, I had a sort of very very. I don't really plan that far ahead, to be honest. But I had kind of a tenuous idea that I might write something else. Um, then, in discussions with the editor with, with the publishers, they sort of said it's quite nice to have a standalone entry point that people can just pick up one book and if they like that um then delve into the into the series and i think there's a there's definitely a point there i think some people are put off by seeing a long series so yeah um so in in some ways i think it's good to just leave that as a standalone um there's a possibility that the timelines could match where hunlaf in the a time for swords series that starts the end of the 8th century um, Dunstan is an old man in the in the eight thirties, late eight thirties. So there's definitely a point where those timelines could cross over, and mm -hmm. an older Hunlaf could meet Dunstan somewhere. You know, they, they they're alive at the same time. Yeah. is basically what I'm saying. So I enjoyed, a possibility. No, I enjoyed Dunstan. Yeah. I thought. I mean, I enjoyed Hunlaf as well. But but uh, I think it's it's funny when you reach a point in your life and you're like, I can relate much more to. The, the aches and pains of Dunstan. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, then the, the youthful sort of energies of, uh, of the other two you've got there. Well, I think, yeah. um, uh, Bayer Brand must get be pretty old by now, isn't he? He's 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 a granddad in the in Forest of Foes, so he's um, <laughs> yeah. he's he's late he's late thirties, but he had he had kids young, so he's like uh, about thirty eight or something. So, but I think yeah. um I think I think Dunstan in on paper was only in his late 40s i just i decided that all his ailments and everything would be you know probably a little bit more so yeah. because yeah. of the time period and the medicine at the time and the fact he's been a warrior all his life so he's had yeah like a professional athlete you know i thought yeah um and I, I some of the reviews you know i got i got a couple of reviews sort of saying oh he's just always going on about his aches and pains and it's rubbish you know? <laughs> and i just thought that's I someone love, who's obviously very young <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those bits. They were some of my favourite bits. I was like, yeah, oh, there goes my back. 
Um, I thought, could I ask the 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 uh, the the Hunlath one, or particularly the um, I haven't read a Night of Flames yet. I'm sort of saving yeah. that as a special treat. Uh, um, but the a time for swords is it? I'm sort yeah. of feeling uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's a moment we could discuss influences because I was feeling I was feeling the name of the rose at that point or as okay. it, influences of that. Is that is that way off I, or? I haven't I haven't read the book of the name of the rose, um, but I've obviously seen the film way back when, yeah. which was great. Um, I think there's a bit of an influence there, but I think actually that was more from um, my editor. I think or it, maybe it was a subliminal idea, but, but but lots of the ideas about the book and stuff kind of came from my editor later on in the process. So I think actually I'd have to say that he had lots of the uh, – he, he sort of sowed some extra thinking, seeds of inspiration into the book, that first draft. Yeah, because I was thinking, I was thinking of the um... – you know the sort of narrator, the old narrator monk, you yeah. know, scribbling away. That's very much how the name of the rose is written. I mean, I don't know. Obviously, the the, the movie doesn't it handles it in a slightly different way, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of an old trope, isn't that, it? And that wasn't um, the thing. I think I think the uh, probably the most direct influence there would really be Bernard Cornwell's Arthurian series. If you haven't read that, have you read those? The the Winter I King. I haven't. No. Oh, I've been I've been a bit to, fast on Bernard Cornwell. I loved all the sharp books. And jumbled well, those up when I was when I was younger, but I've I've read a couple of the uh, whatever he calls them now, the Last read. Kingdom ones. Yeah, yeah, which I quite like, but not nearly as much as some of the other so, ones that people are doing. I thoroughly recommend the books he wrote in the nineties. Um, it's a trilogy, so it's the um, the Winter King is yeah. the first one. Um, then it's uh, I can't remember. Um, finishes off with Excalibur. I can't remember what the second one's called, um, but yeah. fantastic series, and um, that's written from the perspective of an old warrior who's now a monk, and he's writing yeah. it down. I think it's all in first person, and I'd say right. that's probably the biggest influence, and and they were probably the biggest influence to actually get me to start writing the Benicia Chronicles originally as well, because I'd only re read those books probably four or five years beforehand, so that's probably very fresh in my mind. Actually, probably yeah. the the last one. I think the first one was like ninety five, so the the last one was probably only two or three years before you know writing starting yeah. to write the the, the the serpent sword but no i really yeah. enjoy I, well i enjoyed that element of it and i i thought what i what i liked about it was the i think it's the sort of hints that you drop which probably you have no idea how you're going to string all this together but it's like you know hints of you know his name in Cirkland or whatever you know on baghdad he's known as this and then you know the gates of gibraltar he's known as that and i was like yes this is this is the kind of stuff i like to hear but it but that also reminded me a little bit about one of my i suppose you could say my influential authors was george mcdonald fraser and that whole sort of flashman papers kind of thing of you know hints of a, a, another story that maybe you're never going to get to but it, yeah. it just sort of lends to the authenticity somehow of a life uh, interestingly lived, if not well lived. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was definitely, I mean, Flashman, I've read not all of his books. Uh, again, I've read a couple of the Flashman novels and there's definitely um, sort of that idea of this really lived in world and a really lived in character that's got all this life experience. I like yeah. the idea that he's looking back on life through the prism of an incredibly rich and varied past back at yeah. himself when he was only a young man and all the stupidity of, of a young man and um yeah. in in I, I guess the way that we all do you know to some extent but um but yeah so and and you're right i don't really know lots of those things in fact all of those things are just made up on the spur of the moment and then um i kind of think oh maybe one day I'll be able to thread them into a story if I get that far enough along it's quite an interesting premise because obviously with each book it kind of ends we well, haven't read the second book, but you know he's still he's still writing them, right? So they're, in, but you yeah. know it, the first book ends with him kind of going, "Oh, I'm feeling really ill now. I think maybe I'm going to die." You know, in the second <laughs> book, the second book, he kind of is like, "Well, I, I've sort of I've rallied, I've rallied," and the second book kind of begins with him going, "I rallied. I've been nursed back to health by this young monk that's helped sort of look after me. So I'm going to keep writing." And you know, so, so he writes the next oh, right. book, and, okay, it, and at the end of it, he's like, "Oh, I'm feeling really <laughs> shit." You know, I think. <laughs> so whenever I get bored with it or whatever, I just. I just you know, he just yeah. died. You know, that's he it. He didn't doesn't write it. anymore. He so, didn't make I, it this, through this one. Yeah, it's a good so, idea. Um, I like I like the I like the the premise right here. Yeah. So you I, 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 sorry. sorry, you go ahead. 
I was just going to say, you, you said you're writing them at the fourth one in the Warrior, uh, sorry, the Wanderer Chronicles. Yes. What's, yeah. what's after that? What's what's happening? What's what you've got uh, after that on the horizon? Well, the fifth, uh, if I could sort of, if I could get aside, get this one out of the way, then in terms of my fiction stuff, I've also got another idea for, um, I mean, I, there's the shape of that particular series for me is a five book series and I can sort of see the climax building um, and maybe there could be spin-offs. I think that there's, I've got a couple of ideas for spin-offs if, if, if it's worth doing. Um, but aside from that, I've got an idea, totally different period of history, um, sort of 19th century uh, Jewish priest of all things. But I, I think possibly influenced by the fact that I became uh, obsessed with Poirot during uh, the lockdown. So I'm kind of, it feels like it could be a bit CJ Sant for me. And there's this, this amazing guy called Joseph Wolf. He's a real historical figure. Um, and he, he traveled all over the world. Like he was sort of in Central Asia. He was down in the Yemen. He was, you know, in the Crimea. He was all over the place, ostensibly to kind of, uh, I suppose, on his mission. But it, for my kind of fictional purposes, it would be he's, he's sort of, when he's in these places, you know, he gets embroiled in some mystery and he's kind of a Father Brown type figure right. with a side, okay. side, an irreverent sidekick kind of guy. So it'd be a bit, I'm not quite sure whether to make it, assuming I get to it, like rompy in the form of, you know, Flashman, you know, you've got 19th century sort of Flashman meets Father Brown, if that's a thing, or, or a bit more serious and dark, like a sort of CJ Sansom, Shard Lake thing where, you know, it's all a bit more. Well, you know where uh, I'd go you know, with it. I'd, I'd go for the serious side, but that's just yeah. Like, I mean, like well, that's all my my agent wanted a bit more, a bit of serious. But I think yeah. So I I think there's there's it feels like there's some and and, 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 and you know he's written a bunch of um uh you know there's quite a lot of source material in terms of uh, journals or whatever or memoirs that he'd written of his travels. But it, you know I would sort of take him as a character, make him a bit more larger than what he was, and then see whether see what interesting history was going on around the periods he was in these places and see if there's any any have sort you, of scandals or murders, you know, anything kind of have you read the, um, um, the have you read the Paul Fraser Collard novels about Jack No, Collard? I haven't. I've seen I've I've been aware of them. Yeah, they they look very good. I, so I, they're I they're very that. action they're sort of very much sort of the, the action adventure style sharp um you my yeah. books are yours you know the, but um they're really good yeah so they they sort of follow this one character through sort of 19th century and he manages to get to all of these different places very much in a serious yeah. vein very much like the flashman sort of series or sharp yeah, you know where he yeah. ends up in all of these different battles and so he's he's yeah. I mean, I think he's on book 11 or something now, and he's been to Africa, he's been to the Crimea, he's been to America, um, Mexico, he's been all over the place, you know, India. Um, I'm but, quite a sucker for that. Fun. But then do you, I think we mentioned this last time we met, but you, the, the, the problem with those books is that the poor women who these heroes, I mean, if, if they are male protagonists, I should say, yeah. you know, it's like, and I'm finding this a little bit in my series, it's like you sort of have this romance component and then where does it go? Like, do you just show them being really boringly together or, or I mean, or else you end up doing what Bernard Cornwall does, which is just kill them all off. Or, or, or so me. Poor women. Yeah. yeah. Or you, I, yeah. Killing them off. So yeah. There's, people, there's yeah, it's, it's, it is difficult. It is difficult. And people keep saying, you know, you need to, you need to sort of let Bayer Brand have a happy ending and sort of, you know, have a, get married and sort of live happily ever after. But I don't know, you know, is that really on the cards for these these warriors. I don't know. It's interesting. I am trying with, the, with, yeah. the, with as things go on, you know, he's getting a bit older. I say he's like a granddad now. I do try to kind of reflect the fact that he's not the same person. He's got different things that are, are important for him, you know, so he, he thinks more about before rushing into combat, you know, he's thinking a little bit more. He's not just the same character, which I think yeah. sometimes gets lost. You know, you get these characters like Jack Reacher that gets older, but nothing seems to change. He's still, he just rushes in to combat. You know, he's, he's walking around America fighting everybody yeah. um, as if he was 20 years old, you know, and he, he started the first book and he was like in his thirties or whatever, and he must be about 60 or something now. And he's just, nothing seems to have changed in physically or mentally about the guy, which is a bit, yeah, Unbelievable. 
Well, the sales figures, uh, I'm sure, are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe, that maybe we should stick with that. A winning maybe. formula. If he's well, bash, yeah. them, bash them out. There is, there is that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a quick look at some of the comments from people. See if there's any questions, and if anybody's watching that's got any questions for Theo or for me, um, post them in whichever place you're watching. Um, so just so everyone knows, if you're watching, you might be watching this on YouTube or on Facebook or wherever. If you put in a comment there, it will get aggregated through, and we'll see it, and I'll be able to to to, to see them, the comments and um, the questions. So somebody was commenting about the sound earlier for your mic, but I turned your mic up, so hopefully that worked a bit. They didn't comment again, so maybe they just went away, or maybe they could hear. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm not blocking my microphone, I hope. No, I think it's just... <laughs> just so just a nice comment there from Lauren. Oh, listening, brilliant. Listening to Mighty Dawn. I'm really enjoying it, so that's nice. Yeah, it's good. Well, I, in fact, I told Lauren on Facebook that it was it was now available, which obviously I, need, I haven't been doing my job. I should have... <laughs> It's been out since February, but actually, it took five years to get that thing wow. made. So I'm quite glad it it finally exists. It takes and a while. Actually, uh, Simon Mattox, who who, who uh, narrates it, has done a fantastic job. So that's brilliant. It's brilliant when you get a good narrator. And I've, I was talking the other day to someone um, about the fact that I've got the same narrator for every single one of my books so far which um, I think is unusual. You know, I was listening to, actually it was with my wife who we were driving and listening to um, the Graham Norton podcast, um, the book club thing that he does. And he was talking yeah. to um, Ben, I can't think, is it Iranovich? Uh, who does the Rivers of London uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, books. And he was saying that he's got the same narrator for all of his audio books and um, for the whole series. And they were sort of making a big deal out of it. And I was thinking, well, I've got the same narrator for all of my series and for my other series and for Wolf of Wessex. So he's basically, Barnaby Edwards has narrated everything for me and he's been brilliant, really good. So when you do yeah, find the really right good. the right guy, good. it's 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 great. Um, yeah. Another comment here from someone, let's see, from Martin. I have all three of the Viking books. First one I bought whilst on holiday a few years back. Loved it so much. Ordered the second whilst there and pre-ordered the third. There you go. I think this is your books he's talking about. Will there be any yeah, more in the same be. setting? No, there you yes. go. I've already answered I mean, that. My, my, my main task is getting these buggers back from Constantinople and giving them good reasons to to find their when their way back to uh, Scandinavia. So the, sixth, uh, sorry, the fifth book will be the kind of barn-busting climax of the whole thing back in scandinavia so i think it's been interesting actually uh i mean from research purposes i've kind of gone from a place i knew very well in, in a world that i'd researched to the nth degree in scandinavia and then i'm sort of playing catch up in constantinople mm -hmm. in fact today i'm i was writing a scene set in medieval rome about which there's not you know eighth century rome no one has actually oh, you, written that we, we need to, we need to compare notes because without going into you know without giving any spoilers away yeah. The next, the next Bear Brand book. Basically, I put, I bought a couple of books about medieval Rome. So let's, um, we need to compare notes. Oh, I think well, yeah. our, our books yeah, seem yeah. to be treading similar directions often. Yeah. So, um, I think I am sort of getting my head around it. It's taken a while, um, but uh, you know, anything to do with that. Basically, the big cities, and also, I can, yeah, I, I did a tax deductible visit to Constantinople. So why not one to Rome as well? I can take my wife along too. Maybe we should. Maybe um, should maybe but yeah, together. they're coming back. I think we're doing, uh, and and they end up in Francia in this in this fourth book in the sort of sort of second half of the book uh, on kind of on their way back, but obviously lots of complications along the way. So the whole of the whole of book nine of the Bear Brand series, so Forest of Foes, which is out later in the year, yeah, that the whole of that is in is in Francia. I, um, I, I thought they were going to end up in Rome, but things happened, and they end up spending the whole book there. But like you say, which year is this? That's six fifty two, I think. Oh, so it's all the Mer Merovingians. So it's the Merovingian kings. It's um, yeah. yeah. So it's an interesting time. There's there's yes. lots of different kings and lots of different kingdoms and and so suddenly, like you say, playing catch up and thinking, why have I done this? You know, I've taken them yeah. to a place I know nothing about. And in the and in the the, the previous Hunlaf book, A Night of Flames, which has just come out, in that, um, I've taken them from um, Northumbria into Norway or the, the, the different yeah. kingdoms of Norway at the time, which again, I've never been to Norway. I know nothing about, I've had to research everything and there's not much. Did you visit? About no, I haven't. No, it was all during lockdown. So everything oh, yeah. was, 
everything was watching videos on YouTube and Google Maps. Google Earth. Google Earth. Google Earth. Yeah. 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 Um, I did a bit of, I think, in a major dawn, I, I spent a lot of time on Google Earth up the way, probably not that far away from that area, sort of west coast of Norway, where there was some yeah. battle I did. Yeah, but yeah. it was, it was, yeah. This is probably very silly, is that? Yeah, I, I ended up watching like YouTube. There's YouTubers of like people that travel around. I found a couple that going with their baby traveling around like in a sailboat around the world, and they were yeah. all around Norway and around the fjords and stuff. And so I thought, well, that's interesting because you get a view of what it's like from yeah. from the boats, you know, from yeah. even though obviously yeah. the ships have changed, the boats yeah, changed, yeah. but you get to yeah. see from their perspective. And they're like, oh, here we're going up such and such a fjord. And I think, oh, right, okay, <laughs> clocking all yeah. the. The views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's such yeah, a I weird did that, thing. I did that for the, well, actually, the one that you've read of mine, the Burning Sea, the, there's yeah. a sort of river passage one as well, where, I, I mean, it was yes. painstaking going up this bloody, trying to find, like, what's the yes. tributary that's going to lead me up that way. And, of course, none of this ends up in the book because you just, you know, a reader doesn't want to come every inch of the journey, but you sort of need to know it in order to believe it in your own head to then write mm -hmm. the... Well, I've got the same thing in in Norway, and I had an idea that they were going to go further up this river than they did. But in the end, it, it just it just it just felt like well, a I couldn't work out the most important thing is I couldn't work out how much the waterways have changed. There's been so much change in in Norway. Mm. They've got so many hydroelectric plants and so many dams and so many things, canals and whatever. So everything is is all changed. So I had to kind of guess and hope that the rivers were the rivers that you know that that, that were there yeah. or that the rivers that are there now were the rivers that were there you know 1400 years or whatever it is 1200 years yeah, ago yeah. um and i've just put a note in the end of the you know the, the book saying you know i hope <laughs> if not it could be a different river but you know there, there were loads of rivers and lakes so you know if it's not I that know, one, there's it the whole thing one. of the I, I had that in in the, with, with the sort of swedish archipelago and yeah. around stockholm and it's like <laughs> because the water levels I think we're, oh gosh, I can't mm. remember which way around it is. They were higher, higher back in yeah, those days. So yeah. there was sort of, it was more of a big lake than lots of little islands. and weird Exactly. So islands. I sort of thought this, that, oh, well, you know, maybe some of the rivers are deeper yeah. and you know, traversing. Someone somewhere has done that piece of research. I just haven't found it yet. I couldn't find um, it. Not for not for for that part of history. I think um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Once you get beyond, you know, get back beyond sort of eight, like 1,200 years ago, there's not a lot around northern europe it's there's a lot of stuff but there's a when you come to those sort of specific details it's pretty yeah. difficult to find really what what's there i mean just just a quick note about about um research i mean do you enjoy the research uh, and 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 if if writing could be split into sort of like historical fiction at least mm. into sort of research plotting writing and editing how do you split your time across those and which do you prefer and what's your favorite of those uh, wow. Um, What's your least favorite? I think, uh, I think that I, I struggle to get the time down to do the research. I have to admit the, these days, it was something I'd sort of, so I, I'm, I'm very kind of piecemeal in my research, but I seem to be able to snap little nuggets here, there that actually just, and then the story often can fit around some little detail that has just presented itself to me so I, I do enjoy those moments of the little eureka moments that you know you can literally turn around your day because yes you're like, yes i can see yeah. how they can get from there to there well, look or this this thing happens i can't believe it and actually the weird thing is that sometimes you imagine somewhere's going in a story and then you discover that there is yeah that it actually that happened kind of back... there's something similar yeah, yes it's, yeah it's I, weird. I... There are yeah, weird yeah. things like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I find that as well. So, so I don't know quite what's going on in that in that sense. But um, I let me. I don't really enjoy the editing process. But it, mm. but it, again, it depends. I like slashing things with a red pen because that generally makes it a lot be better. But I think I had one of my most sort of almost soul destroying moments when I it, actually I'd put in the first draft of. Uh, or put in, submitted the manuscript for um, a burning sea. And my agent read it a couple of weeks later. And he's like, yeah, amazing, great. Let's see what Sarah, my um, my editor at the time. In fact, all my ex editors, I've had three now, and they're all called Sarah. Um, so the first Sarah uh, said, you know, Theo, have you got time for a meeting? And I was like, yes, okay. <laughs> so we went, 
and and she's like there's one or two things that just aren't quite working here and we basically had this hour and a half meeting and every minute of which was revealed something new that basically meant that the whole of that scene was out the whole of that scene and as i kind of was got to the end of this meeting and the whole world was had turned to jelly as i walked away from this pub <laughs> and realized so you know i've written a bloody novel of about 160,000 words of which i have to rewrite about 120 and literally it did take that so the the you know yes i quite like the tinkering stage and you think yeah that really gets that really works but when it's like wholesale mm. sort of you know earth shattering moments like that i can do without i've, I've um, been lucky in that regard most of the time i the, the biggest rewrite i had was in a night of flames actually no no yeah. it was um no it was the one before it was the time for swords time for and swords, as i said yeah. before um, i think because it was the first one in this new series um rightly so my editor sort of said you know really want to nail this and there's bits that are you know we can strengthen bits of it and we sort of talked mm. about how to, how it's going to evolve into a series and stuff and so this whole thing of adding you know the book and sort of more you know, we changed mm. but it, but but that again that conversation was me just thinking what you want to remove this character completely you want to add a new character you want to change the motivation of the whole story what yeah. and it's like it's like what i'm gonna and, and, and the way you know I, I left that meeting thinking i'm gonna have to throw away half the book in the end I needed to rewrite kind of the first two or three chapters completely. And then yeah. I could just thread in a few little notes here and there throughout the rest of the book to kind of make yeah. it work. But but I think if I'd followed every single note that I was given, it would have been a, a, even more yeah. laborious. I mean, I still took me a couple of weeks, you know, but it's painful. The weird thing, the weird thing about that, that experience for me was actually the, the energy. It was quite soul-destroying, but the moment. But then when I kind of got into it, the energy for the way I rewrote it, it was like, it was so much, you know, such a better book for well, it. Then. And the pace was a lot quicker. And, you know, so you can't regret that you had to do it. It's just, I suppose it's just, a, it's like anything. It's an emotional process. Well, yeah, you need <laughs> to, you need to kind of come to terms with it. I think, I think the initial thing is just, it's almost like grief because it's so difficult, so much hard work to write a novel that when, I don't know about you, but when I finished and I've done my own edits and I've sort of get it out there, I feel, in my heart of hearts, I feel it's done now. I can breathe. Yeah. I can move on. That's it. You kind of know that that's not the case because the editors are going to yeah. come back and say something. But for a few weeks there, there's like a moment of complete peace. I'm at peace with the world. The novel is oh, done. Yeah. And then, then when they come back and say, actually, you need to rewrite a third of it or whatever, it's soul destroying because it is yeah. because you you suddenly have yeah. to do a huge piece of work that you didn't want to do and if you thought that it was you know if you thought that it was needed to be done in the first place you would have done it right so you, at the beginning you just couldn't see it but so often you can't you can't see it it's like yeah, exactly. it's literally impossible to see until until it's sort of you know out there but do you do you have a little uh, ritual of celebration that for when you finish these <laughs> these books or not not really Anything i mean you do? Not... Have a beer and that's it, really. I mean, no, I don't really have any ritual. I mean, I think the the, the thing I was thinking the other day is that I've written, I think it's twelve novels now, mm. something like that. And um, kind of run of the mill for you. <laughs> well, no, but I haven't. I haven't had a single book launch. I do think it's funny. I see people <clears throat> online having these book launch parties and they're going off and you know, celebrating. And I've, I don't get invited to them, but you know, I, I <laughs> think everyone's. Oh, you can come to mine. Like, I'll come I to you. My book launch. I've planned so, my book launch way before I've written the book. <laughs> okay, right. Well, I've never had one. And I and I just think, like, should I have a book launch? Maybe I should have a book launch. So, anyway, I've never had one. So I think maybe you need to mark it in some, you know, more important way than I do, which is basically just go, oh, the book's come out. I think now for release day, I've learned that I can't actually get any writing done on actual launch day because there's so much social media stuff that goes on and people contacting you and oh, tagging you in stuff and it's kind of distracting. Yeah. You end up sort of feeling like you want to be tweeting about it and talking online about it. So now I do give myself the well, day off. fair enough. That's when fair it's, enough. <laughs> when, I just think I'll just do social off, media stuff. Hey. I know, but <laughs> feels, feels wrong. I feel, I've got this mindset that if I'm not writing, that I'm not earning money. It's a really weird thing because you kind of know that the yeah. books that are earning money are the ones that are already out there published. Yeah. But I feel if I. But stop... I think you're very good at. I think you're very good at. Um, you know, sort of having presence online and keeping things. <laughs> Doing this. And, well, yeah. They, I mean, yeah. This this is great. Sort of proactive uh, way of sort of engaging with people, which now is such a. You know, it's possible, and why not? It's great. 
it, it feels like it's something that's necessary. I think it's really whether you're self published or traditionally published like we are. I think it's something that really is is an is a necessity. I'm going to pick up some of the other questions yeah, here do. as well and do, comments. Do. Just a comment, a question here from Robert Wickham. How did you get involved with Grimfrost? Are you involved I, with Grimfrost? I didn't even know yeah, you were. I think. There you go. I think I tell came us, across. Tell us about Grimfrost. In, I think I came across them on Instagram, um, just through sort of searching viking something or other and uh, so i came across them and then i realized that they had this massive massive following and it was just before the second book the sacred storm was coming out and so i got in touch with their um i think it's called arva and anna maybe even arva and anna uh um anyway arva certainly was the one i was in in contact with who very kindly sort of reviewed the book um got behind it you know actually provided me i'm not even sure that drinking horn doesn't come from grimfast but um i think they're you know and and it's been a while since i've had some direct contact with them but um they were very supportive of the couple of books that when they came out um so actually it's it's a relationship i'd like to develop because they have something like a million or more i'm probably close to two million followers so as a you, you know for you matthew as a someone in this kind of area um they do sell books on their platform as well and they coolly said to me it's like oh yeah when we sell a book it probably sells you know 10 20 000 copies just like that and i was like yes i really want to talk to you um uh i'm not sure mine has sold 10 or twenty thousand copies on their platform but anyway they they it, it's 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 really cool stuff and actually it's quite good for um uh you know looking at what authentic viking kit looks like if you if you want to shortcut your research yeah well that sounds great i mean that's in, that's interesting so you straight away i'm thinking right i'm gonna to have to contact grimfrost they sound like yeah, uh, they're I've, really I've, seen, I've seen the you know i've seen this sort stuff of like but... reconstruction stuff yeah 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 um so terry rudge saying nice stuff about about my books and about just reading in general and saying that he's hoping that he's going to pick up yours. So, um, and that uh, he's going to pick up yours and hopefully he's going to get, uh, get addicted. So let's, let's hope so. And moving on, uh, other comments. Oh, look, cause, um, fellow, um, Viking age novelist, Eric Schumacher. Oh, yes, who's, Eric. Um, hello, Eric. Hello, Eric. Yes. Yeah, so Eric's, um, in, All right, in the are you US. In California. Yeah. Somewhere in the US. Right? Which is, um, Cinco de Mayo in um, in uh, that that side of the world Mexican celebration, which all the Americans on my channel have been saying, "Oh, you should be celebrating Cinco de Mayo," and I'm like, "That's actually a very Mexican thing." So why would we be celebrating it? I don't know. I looked it up because I lived in Spain for like twenty years or something, and um, I'd never really heard of it because it's not a Spanish thing. And I looked it up, and it's actually um, the Mexicans beating Spain in a battle in early nineteenth century on the 5th of may that's so that's <laughs> that's why but apparently it's a it's a really big deal in mexico and, the, yeah, and, Water, and waterloo day yeah so, it, but it's, it's a big time. deal and it's a big deal of course all the the spanish most of the spanish-speaking people i guess in in america have links to um, central america and, and mexico i guess so it's a big deal there but it's not a big deal here so but anyway happy cinco de mayo um or think of my as I would say in in Spain. Um, anyway, so yeah, Eric Schumacher. For those who don't know, has written um, quite a few Viking novels. So check him out. And yeah, he says he can Sigurd relate so Sword. much. I, I think I read his. It was a second in his. I forget the name of the series, but it's called the the one I read was Sigurd Swords, and it was very very good. Yeah, I think I, I can't remember that one as well. That I read. I read one of them, but um, yeah, I read a book. It was all good. Gave him a quote. I can't remember which one it was. This is one of the things I find as a as a writer, you get asked to read lots of novels of a similar genre, um, and it's difficult to remember them all after a while. But um, it's always it's it's a good part of the job, I guess. Um, although increasingly, I contact other writers, and they're like, "I'm too busy. I'm too busy to to read and give you a quote." And I'm thinking, "Well, I get that. I get that." But you know, at some point, you've got to pay it, pay it forward, pay it back, whatever the the term is. Um, yeah, I think so too. Looking forward to Theodore's masterclass, the history quill next month. Um, will you Thank be doing you. a masterclass, Matthew? Hint, hint. Well, actually, Marie, I already have done a masterclass for the history quill way back about, I don't know when it was, probably a year ago or a few months ago. I don't know. Time is 
it doesn't make it doesn't mean anything to me anymore um sitting in this writing room it could have been, only been three months ago or a year ago i don't know but anyway sometime in the past i did a master class um all about writing um fight scenes and um and battle scenes um for the history quill and it went pretty well i thought so you never know maybe one day they'll ask me to come back and do do another one and um, she said, your audio is still tinny and low. Sorry, I turned his volume up. I don't know what else to do. Um, I'm not sure. My, my microphone maybe is not. I don't even know where the microphone is on this computer. But um, so, apologies for that. Yeah. <laughs> so Jean um, asked about how do you research fight scenes and how much do you stick with the history? I'm guessing that's the history, I think. It may have been a, a, an extra one. Actually, came I, tried up with, do, I tried to do. I tried to research fight fight scenes by joining a, or taking medieval fighting classes, combat classes. Ah. And after about two lessons, two or three lessons, there was I was sort of in a very quite small room. I felt with a guy who was completely bald with lots of tattoos and a very elaborate beard, and realized in about 20 minutes that I was really not very dangerous with a sword, which is quite a shameful thing to, to acknowledge as a, you know, doing the kind of thing that we do. But um, one thing, and, and I, I, it was quite expensive as well. So I only managed two or three lessons and got poked in the face with, you know, the face guard and everything just mm -hmm, going, yeah. okay, I would be dead in about five seconds in a, a shield wall. Oh, yeah. um, but I suppose the one takeaway from that, or there were a couple, but the main one was, you know, if you have, if you live in that sort of belligerent world, then the first thing you do with your child, or particularly, I suppose, if you have a son is, you know, here's a wooden sword. You know, if you're five years old, we're going to teach you how to do something with that sword. And uh, so, you know, that was something that I hadn't really sort of followed through in my own head. So that was useful. But I, yeah. I, I would get back into it if I could find the right club because it, it does. I mean, I forget the name of it's Christian Cameron, isn't it? He does yeah. those amazing videos, and he does look incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I think he, I think he could probably uh, kill us in many, many ways. Yeah, but he's a nice, he's a nice guy. So hopefully he won't. Yes, yeah, so hopefully he'd hold back. But, um, but yeah, so I watched all his videos. They're great, great for watching. But I, I did a bit of fencing, not. Um, like you did doing sort of um, this uh, sort of reenactor, I don't know, historical, whatever it is, medi was it HEMA um, that you did? I don't know what, what, what it's what it's called, like medieval sword play. Whatever oh, I no, I don't. I, I have no idea. He had lots of these old um, sort of medieval texts that you sort of okay. to try and decipher. The so that's like the sort of stuff movements that... they were trying to describe in incredibly yeah. convoluted language. So, so that's of, the sort of stuff yeah. that Christian Cameron reads, and he's really into that sort of 14th century, all the different yeah, um, it was all that kind of stuff, all the different fencing masters from Italy and Germany mm. and stuff. Um, so I did a little bit of fencing. I did saber and at no great level, and for about a year, just going to a club in the University of Bath. I lived near Bath. Um, uh, like you, I was dreadful at it and wasn't dangerous at all at it but i did learn a few things um i i sort of learned how incredibly tiring it is and how knackering it is winding I, was one. I just i just learned about how well fencing is, is different and some of the moves that i use in the descriptions um are completely wrong for the medieval period but they kind of translate well into writing so i think that's one of the important things is the question of how, how close we stick with history i think is not particularly i think um in my case you just want to make the action scenes realistic and believable, um, but whether they're actually authentic to the time period is is questionable. Um, but but some of the moves that, that that I describe are much more based around sort of modern fencing or much later sort of fencing techniques, which would not be accurate for the type of swords they're using. But still, it works. Who, who, who do you? What other authors? I mean, apart from your your good self, do, do you think are particularly strong on? combat scenes for well i did I, well i'd imagine i haven't read many of his books but um i'd imagine that christian cameron um because he seems to a write a million books but also know like everything he used to know about armed combat and unarmed combat so i'd imagine he would do a good job um bernard cornwell does great battle scenes yeah. um i used so in the right in the master class that i did writing um about writing battle scenes i use yeah. some examples from david gemmel as well if you read yeah, the david yeah. gemmel fantasy and historical fiction 
um, novelist, no longer with us, sadly. Um, Joe Angus Crombie. Donald. I haven't read. Oh, I've, read I, I've only read a little bit of, of Joe Abercrombie, so I've, I haven't read enough to really get into. I've oh, only you've read. Got read re you've got to read it. I, he's he, he's definitely one of my favourite authors. I know he's really? not. Um, he's not. His, he's not technically. He's not historical, but it sort of feels like a similar world. In, a, in I keep hearing everybody ways. saying that, and I picked up the the blade itself, and I read maybe the first hundred pages or something. Just didn't it didn't click for me. So maybe I just need to pick it up again and see. Got... Yeah, I think it's a funny one because it sort of it folds back on itself a lot. Uh, like he's just had a, a new trilogy come out, which which is just the characterization is some of the best I've read across the board. But he there's a lot of self reference back into the books he's already done, and and I and you're right, I didn't particularly enjoy that first one. Um, but as it goes okay. on, I do think he's he, he he's got you know some of the best dialogue out there i think and, and some of the most interesting sort of characters too but i'm very good at fighting i thought well that's yeah it sounds good i mean i everybody says it's good so i have to give it another chance i think i think it's more to do with me and my moment of reading it rather than there was nothing bad about it it just it felt like it wasn't going anywhere um yeah. the story it felt quite quite um you know there was, it felt like there was no plot. It felt like it was all character driven, no plot. And in yeah. the end, I just got a bit like, oh, where's this going? But I'll give it another. Yeah, time. I think if there's, a, yeah, you're right. If there's a, if there's a weakness, it is, it is that he sort of, he's very much stronger. If he was a top Trump, you know, on characterization, he'd give him like <laughs> give him 95, 10, 100, yeah, plot, yeah. plot, you'd be sort of down at 65 or 60. But actually, <laughs> funny enough, should, <laughs> we should do this. We should do a writer, exactly. writer top Trumps. Yes, yeah. there you go. That's the way we'll actually make some money. <laughs> That's it. So um, there's a few more questions here. This is a big one. I don't know if we can actually answer this question here, but any thoughts on approaching plotting when based in actual historical times with real historical characters? So, well, well I think you're. I think you're, um, Mary. What, didn't you mention you were going to do the masterclass in June? The historical i think she did the history quill so that's kind of what what i'm doing is like how to structure a historical novel or how to plot well, there you go then novel. so let's not go into that it's, I'll bear it's a big, that in mind. that's a big question though that's a big question yes. to answer um uh, let's see if there's anything else then so oh we've got confirmation of the date of my master class that i couldn't remember it was june 2021 because mj porter who is another writer of many different things fantasy and modern or i don't know um, second world war sort of period but also a lot of viking um and dark mm. age anglo-saxon stuff so yeah, has many many stuff. many books out there she writes even faster than me theo so um <laughs> quite 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 hideously fast actually I'm very jealous yeah um <clears throat> So, yeah, so that's how long ago it was, and it feels like it was only yesterday. It was actually nearly a year ago. Um, I think that's it. So I don't think there's any more questions. There's a few more comments just saying nice things. Um, loved all three books in your series, Theo. Glad to hear there's a, another on the on its way. So That's very all, kind. Thank you. All good. So I think that probably is, is enough. To and, wind um, it up. Yeah, to wind it up. And... Um, so thank you everybody for joining. And um, let me let me. I'm gonna to have to crack open another beer here. Have to recharge you your um your yeah. horn. Sort of farewell. Of beer oh. left. Yeah. So thank you to everybody for coming along. Thanks, of course, um, very much to Theo for his time and all the great answers to all these lots of questions that um, that I've posed to you and that other people have asked you. And um, without further ado, I no, think it's we'll been just a pleasure. Good night. Oh. And Skull to everybody. And um, see you soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.